Welcome everyone. I am Adesha Josh, and this is Africa Matters. We begin in Uganda where multiple suicide attacks left several people dead and dozens injured on Tuesday. A Daesh linked group has claimed responsibility. America's top diplomat Antony Blinken visits Kenya, Nigeria and Senegal on a diplomatic push to re-engage with the continent. And we take you to Kenya, where a stylist is putting a smile on the faces of cancer patients. Uganda is reeling in the wake of two deadly suicide explosions this week that left six people dead, including three bombers and more than 30 injured. The bombs were detonated near the parliament building and a police station in the central business district of the capital, Kampala. Police say a fourth attacker was arrested before he could detonate his explosives. We were able to, uh, to recover uh, two bombs uh, from Mose at his home in uh, Nansa Nakatoke, and they're all going to be detonated by the bomb squad. So all those are efforts. Mabir is safe. There is no additional uh, bomb. Daesh has claimed responsibility for the attacks, but police initially blamed the Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, a Ugandan insurgent group based in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The group was established in Uganda in 1995 as a merger of several rebel factions and portrayed themselves as religious crusaders. They were defeated a decade later by the Ugandan army and forced to flee to the DRC, where the UN says they have killed thousands of civilians since 2013. In April 2019, Daesh began to claim responsibility for attacks believed to be carried out by the ADF. Security experts believe leaders of the ADF pledged allegiance to Daesh in 2016. The U.S. State Department designated the ADF as a foreign terrorist organization in March. In October this year, police blamed the Allied Democratic Forces for two blasts on a public bus and a restaurant in the capital Kampala. But Daesh claimed responsibility. Brenda Gitungi is an independent research consultant and counterterrorism analyst focused on African terrorist organizations. She joins me now from Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. How would you describe the nature of the security threat Uganda is dealing with? Uganda is obviously dealing with a major um, terrorism threat at the moment. As Julie noted, the attack on uh, General Wamala and his daughter, as well as preceding incidences that happened between July and September on civilian where they were discriminately uh, targeted by armed groups that were considered to be linked to um, the ADF. Um, but I'd like to note that this also goes as far back as even the beginning of the year where um, civilians were being targeted in remote villages by uh, uh, unknown armed men um, uh, using the modus operandi of the ADF um, in, uh, in the eastern DRC. So. Um, what we're seeing is sort of a, a build-up to what we've seen in the past few weeks um, in, in Kampala. Um, and this has also ended uh, counter-terrorism operations by Ugandan police and intelligence, which has involved the rest of uh, people who are suspected to be linked with ADF networks in the country, as well as the sorting of um, attacks um, in Kampala, where... Um, very serious suicide bombings have been prevented by security forces. So um, even with the bombings that we saw last month in, in Kampala, um, it appears that uh, what happened on Tuesday was sort of a lead up to uh, what we saw. So Uganda has uh, appeared to have reached the threshold where it has officially uh, dealing with a major uh, terrorism threat. Well, it's been more than two decades since the ADF launched an attack of this magnitude in Uganda. What's driving this renewed attacks? And is it clear what the group's motive is? Well, the motive is twofold. So already we know that the ADF was established in uh, Uganda and was pushed out and is now stationed in Eastern DRC. Um, I believe that uh, the goal of the group to return to Uganda and uh, begin perpetrating attacks was not lost on them at all. Um, in fact, there was a, a debate within the leadership of the organization as to whether affiliating with the Islamic State would divert its um, its goal of returning to Uganda and perpetrating attacks. Um, but it appears that this was just a long time coming. And uh, secondly, as an affiliate of the Islamic State, the group also follows the group's uh, motto or 
a goal to remain and expand, which is certainly what the group has done by expanding its area of operations into Uganda. And it appears also that the Islamic State is quite pleased to be claiming attacks in a country that it has never uh, before. But how will the ADS allegiance to Daesh impact its operations in the region? And what counterterrorism strategies should be deployed? Well, um, as we know again, that the ADF is uh, stationed or based in Eastern DRC, but it has a very expansive network throughout the entire region um, that remain inactive. So what we've seen in the past uh, few weeks is that uh, these networks have, uh, have become active and um, these attacks might also activate um, networks in uh, countries such as Uganda, in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, not necessarily that they'll perpetrate attacks, but they might now become um, more useful in terms of logistics, recruitment, weapons, and, and, and so on. Um, so I think like the best thing for uh, security forces, which I think they've already begun to do, is coordinate with regional intelligence agencies. Uh, since um, um, they are aware of the terrorism threat that they're facing and the perpetrators or the individuals involved in extremist networks in their countries, which would be of great help to Uganda. Brenda Gitungu is an independent research consultant and counterterrorism analyst. Thank you so much for speaking to Africa Matters. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has called for a ceasefire in Ethiopia, saying the conflict threatens to spill over into the Horn of Africa. America's top diplomat was speaking in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. It's his first visit to the continent officially, and the trip includes stops in Nigeria and Senegal. Lincoln has urged all parties involved in the war in Tigray to cease fighting. We're looking for all sides, as I said, uh, to step back. The TPLF and the uh, OLA should halt their advance uh, on Addis. Uh, we'd like to see the parties come together at the table to put in place a cessation of, uh, of hostilities. Uh, we need to see humanitarian assistance flow freely uh, now. Uh, we need to see uh, people detained, uh, released, uh, and uh, we uh, need to see everyone engaging in an effort to resolve the differences that, uh, that exist uh, peacefully and, uh, and constitutionally. We have more stories coming up for you here on Africa Matters, including... Uganda's schools have had the longest closure in Africa due to the coronavirus pandemic and students aren't the only ones suffering. I am Darren Alan Cheyune in one Kampala neighborhood where teachers are trying to make ends meet by illegally conducting in-person lessons. Aman Masharia, I'm in Kenya's capital city, Nairobi, and I'll explain how the expense of cancer treatment in Kenya restricts proper care to the rich, causing other patients to struggle to get treatment. Welcome back, everyone. We head to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where a young entrepreneur has invented a mobile app, one he hopes will curb high mortality rates in the mining industry. Dominic Brian Amondi has the details. This is one of thousands of mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These men earn their living by digging up precious stones, but it involves a lot of hard labor and comes at a great risk. Siddharth Kara, a researcher and activist with the Kara Center for Human Rights Policy, estimates that at least 2,000 miners die each year working in the mines. Sebiera Riziki, a mother of five, lost her husband in a mine accident just two years ago. Yes, people continue to go to the mines even if they never stop collapsing. And each time, people die. If you're lucky, you will find the dead. If you're unlucky, they disappear. That cruel reality is what entrepreneur Victoire Shukuru says pushed him to develop the mean security app. Given that I am in the digital field, I said to myself, I had to create a digital solution that can help our brothers who, for lack of other opportunities, resort to mining to find a means of survival. The mobile app uses GPS technology integrated with an electronic safety belt which is connected to a smartphone. It allows managers to track a miner's movement underground and respond if they are in danger. 
This is a safety belt. If at a moment something dangerous were to happen to us down here, they will be alerted quickly on the other side and will be saved. For Shukuru and other miners, the new system offers hope, meaning fewer women like Subiera Riziki will have to go through the pain of losing someone they love. Dominic Branomondi, TRT World, Africa Matters. In Uganda, 50 million students have been kept home since March last year when the government shut schools to stop the spread of the coronavirus. The extended closure has forced some teachers out of the profession and others out of the bounds of the law. Darren Alan Cheyune reports. For 18 months now, Farida Namosisi's home has been busy, not with visitors, but with pupils. The 27-year-old illegally teaches a nursery class of about 10 children each weekday. When the schools closed last year, they stopped paying us. So it was a hard time. Like, it was hard for us, for me to buy food at home. My husband wasn't working, I also wasn't working. So it was very hard for me. That's why I decided to start teaching from my home. Uganda's schools have been shut as a preventive measure against COVID-19 since March last year. A longer period of school closure than anywhere else in the world, according to the UN. On a normal day, teachers would lead about 100 pupils through their lessons in this classroom. But it has now been deserted and some students have quit school altogether. During this period, only a few of the country's 15 million students have been attending classes online, placing an impossible strain on parents. The burden of long-distance learning has led some to seek out professionals. I took the risk because I believe education was more important for now, the fact that they had forgotten everything. So them interacting with a teacher one-on-one -on -one was better for them to learn and go further with their education. So that's why I decided to take them to the teachers. President Yoweri Museveni says that schools will be opened in January once the vaccination rate has improved. But authorities predict around 30% of the students are likely never to return to their education. And the process of integrating pupils back into the system after almost two years of absence is likely to be complicated. It's not going to be easy in the sense that uh, uh, the students have been diverted. They've grown up at different ages because learning takes place and we hold content, what we teach the students depending on the age as well. And this is what calls for the teachers now to change the methodologies of delivery. Because you have to take some time modeling these students to bring them back into what we call uh, the mainstream education system. The pandemic has not only robbed Uganda's children of their education, but also many of their teachers. Those like Namusisi, who have bent the rules to continue their work, look forward to having full classrooms once again. Darren Alan Cheyune, Africa Matters, Kampala. Breast cancer is one of the leading causes of death in Kenya. It affects mothers, career women, employees and small business owners. The impact is felt on their families, the wider community and on Kenya's economy. Hair loss during treatment leaves many survivors feeling vulnerable. But one beautician is hoping to change that, one wig at a time. And Macharia reports. In Kenya, women under 50 account for half of those diagnosed with breast cancer. 44-year-old Coletta Munde is one of them. She was supposed to start treatment in India in March, but due to the outbreak of coronavirus, she was forced to seek treatment in Kenya. During her treatment, she realized she was misdiagnosed. It was painful because the doctor I had was a professor and I never expected to be wrongly diagnosed from such a doctor. Access to cancer treatment is also a challenge. It's an affordable for most Kenyans who live on less than $3 a day. If you have cancer, I mean, when you're not financially stable especially, dying is easy. Statistics show that cancer cases are rising. Kenya records about 7,000 new cases each year. 
Dr. Lucy Wende, an oncologist, attributes the rise to lack of cancer treatment centers. The facilities are very few. Most of them concentrated within Nairobi for the private facilities. For the government facilities now is when we're having others coming up. Previously it was just Kenyatta. Colette Mwende says her life changed after being diagnosed with the disease. I lost my friends, my family members too. I have family members who haven't called me for six good months. It reaches a point where you become depressed. Cancer is the third leading cause of death in Kenya, and with limited access to treatment, cancer patients like Coletta continue to suffer. It's for that reason that Diana Akech, a beautician, took it upon herself to help put a smile on cancer patients by providing free wigs in her Nairobi salon. For Coletta, chemotherapy treatments might be saving her life, but the loss of her hair has left her feeling exposed. But finally, she has something to smile about. Wow! <laughs> I'm very happy. Diana Ketch started doing her makeover seven years ago after her friend got diagnosed with cancer. She was so happy and she told me, Diana, what you've done to me today, I need you to bless somebody else. Somebody ever comes to you who has, doesn't have money and they would love you to give them a wig. Please, for my sake, I would love you to bless somebody with a wig. But for the women who have received them, it's one less thing to worry about as they continue their fight against cancer. And Masharia Africa Murders, Nairobi. And now for a roundup of other stories making news across the continent. In Khartoum, thousands of people are demonstrating against the military coup. Security forces have fired live ammunition at protesters, wounding dozens of people, some of them fatally. The UN, US and other countries have urged the military leaders to avoid using force against peaceful demonstrators. Sudanese are calling for a return to civilian rule. There was panic buying for fuel in Abuja on Tuesday after petroleum and natural gas workers threatened to go on strike in two weeks. The union has accused energy giant Chevron of failing to pay salaries and benefits. Nigeria is the biggest oil producer in sub-Saharan Africa and a member of OPEC. In Burkina Faso, hundreds of protesters have marched in the capital, demanding President Kabore step down for failing to stop terror attacks by Daesh and Al-Qaeda. More than 50 soldiers and civilians were killed in the latest assault. Burkina Bees also want the French forces patrolling the country, as well as neighboring Mali and Niger, saying their presence leads to more attacks by insurgent groups. The husband of Kenyan long-distance star Agnes Dirop has been charged with her murder. Ibrahim Rochid pleaded not guilty before the High Court in Eldoret. He is accused of stabbing the 25-year-old athlete to death last month. Dirop broke the women's 10-kilometer world record in September. We now head to the region around northern Mali's Lake Fagubin, which was a hub for fishing, agriculture and forestry back in the 1970s. But recurrent droughts and high temperatures have turned this former oasis into a desert. Adam Amunu has the story. Lake Fagubin was once one of the largest in West Africa. But now, instead of waves of water from the Niger River, it's filled with waves of sand that have withered its shores. Over the years, residents have seen their lakeside village fade away. The water receded and trees started to grow around the lake. Then the trees started to disappear and people grew crops where the trees used to be. As the lake dried up, more than half of the population fled to the region and more than 200,000 people have had to adapt to their traditional livelihoods. Some farmers who once lived off the land have been forced to turn to livestock herding. They must trek long distances to find water to keep their animals alive. I prefer growing crops to livestock farming. You don't have much in the way of expenses. You grow crops and you harvest them. Animals are much more tiring. You have to move them around, water them, feed and run around after them day and night. The dry earth hasn't just been a drain on local life. It's also seeping out flammable gas. If it ignites, the few remaining shrubs will be killed, leaving the soil unsuitable for further agriculture. The worsening living conditions have led to rising crime rates. Mace farmer Mahmoud Usman says there is not a day that goes by without conflict, 
as herders and farmers fight over the few tracts of arable land that are left. After we have harvested our products, we have to transport it, and that's dangerous. Even the women you see behind me are at risk. Their maize may be stolen on the way. The UN climate body says average temperatures in northern Mali are expected to rise 4.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. That's likely to exacerbate droughts in the African Sahel region and make life even harsher for the inhabitants. The biggest investment that's needed is not to distribute aid to people. What's needed is to try and identify problem and resolve it, which means stabilizing the dunes to immediately hold the erosion and fill the lake with water again so that people can earn a living. If you look at those parts of the lake where there is still water, you will see some wonderful livestock. The climate crisis has literally reshaped the landscape for Malians here. It's unclear how much more they can bear before they draw a line in the sand. Adam Amunu, Africa Matters. The Great Green Wall is an ambitious project started by the African Union almost 15 years ago. It aims to plant a line of trees across the continent from Senegal in the west to Djibouti in the east to stop sand from the Sahara spreading into agricultural regions. But the climate crisis has interrupted the project. And now, with the help of local communities, the initiative has received new momentum. Raoul Radhakrishnan has more. Ibrahima Falls Lime Tree Orchard is located in the unlikeliest of places, in the Sahel region of northwest Senegal and at one end of the Great Green Wall, an ambitious project to plant trees in an 8,000-kilometer line from Senegal to Djibouti. The water and forestry service had planted trees in many parts of the forest to stop the advance of the desert. The cutting of trees that makes part of the strip along with other trees has stopped the desert because before, everything we tried to put in place here was doomed to failure. It's only 4% of the project's original goal has been met because as temperatures rose and rainfall reduced, millions of those planted trees died. But the Great Green Wall has worked in some areas. The soil has been enriched by planting citrus trees and that has helped locals grow several staples, including tomatoes and onions. Today, everyone benefits from my orchard. I managed to share with the people what the orchard brings me, and if this orchard is what it is today, it is thanks to my repeated efforts tending to it. A hundred small orchards have popped up around Senegal's Kabimer town, and residents have used any profits to replace straw homes with cement structures and to buy sheep, goats and chickens. Any project has to start from the communities if you want it to be sustainable. And that is what we call community ownership. There are two elements that guarantee the sustainability of projects. If you do a top-down project where you don't involve the communities, you go away and the project falls apart. Preserving the environment here is becoming increasingly necessary. The whole world is seeing that if we don't preserve or recover the forest, we're heading straight for the edge. So it is necessary today that everyone rethinks this world and the forms of development that until now have been the basis of this massive destruction of nature by man. And the consequences are there. So it is no longer a question of saying we must preserve it for our children. We must preserve it now. Early this year, donor countries and the African Development Bank pledged $20 billion to complete the Great Green Wall by 2030, but another $23 billion is still needed. If that can be achieved, the Great Green Wall will be the largest living structure on the planet, three times the size of the Barrier Reef. Rahul Radhakrishnan, Africa Matters. And staying in West Africa, in this week's city profile, we'll explore Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso.
that's our show this week. Please do not forget to share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle at Josh for scoops, breaking news, or whatever else you would like to share. We'll leave you with these images from across the continent.